30 years is an awful long time in the world of mountain bike development. So let's take a look at one of the first ever mass produced downhill bikes to see just how far we've come. The modern downhill bike is a super capable race bred machine. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It is a thing of beauty, but let's whip back over 30 years, back up the family tree to find its original ancestor. The Velici from 1992. Now this was really early days in the world of downhill mountain biking. Actually the first ever downhill world champs took place just two years earlier in 1990. And this was the first ever mass produced full suspension downhill bike. It says Saracen on the top tube, it says Sintesi on the swing arm. I shall explain. All right, so this bike is from around 1992-93, and that was when downhill racers were deciding what bikes they needed. And actually, uh, that was around the same time that I started mountain biking, a bit later than that, 1995, and I used to buy all the magazines. I was completely bitten by the bug. And if my paper around money could afford it, I'd also buy Mountain Bike Action from America. I remember seeing a quote from American racer, Kim Sonia, saying that full suspension bikes were the future of downhill. And I was gutted, a little bit heartbroken, because I couldn't afford a full suspension bike at that time. And this was really the start of Daniel Racer saying, we need these. It's hard to believe that actually they were trying to decide between their hardtails and full suspension bikes. When you look at our 200 millimeter plus travel bikes now, they thought they could still be a little bit faster on a hardtail. The old downhill tracks of the early 1990s were a mix of fast fire roads and single track. There was a World Cup series and you had Norba races in the USA and races like the Kamikaze that were just flat out down Mammoth Mountain on the ski slopes and fire roads. So this bike was designed by Marzocchi, uh, an Italian company, I'm sure you're still aware, that to this day still make suspension forks and shocks. And it was actually built by another Italian company, Velici, who are known for their motorsport manufacturing. And this was basically to test out Marzocchi's new suspension. The story goes that in 1992, the legendary BMX and downhill racer, Dave Cullinan, tried out the Velici full suspension bike and decided he needed it. But at the time, he rode for Iron Horse, who only made a hardtail. So the calls went out and they branded one up as an Iron Horse. Dave went on to be the 1992 US national and world champion. The story that goes down in mountain biking folklore, where Dave was the only person to jump a wooden bridge at the bottom of that Bromont course, and he took that win. making the Iron Horse FS that was quickly renamed the Iron Horse Bromont the world's fastest bike. But of course, it was actually a Felici, but it wasn't long before other riders decided they needed it in on the game as well. Which meant that we had Velici's branded up as Iron Horse, Kona, Sintesi, Saracen, like this one. I'm sure there are others I can't remember as well, but this bike is actually from Team Saracen Calls, an early British team with some pretty legendary riders on there that I actually grew up with and have friends with. I don't know whose bike this is, but I'm guessing it might be Rob Warnus, it's quite big. They had Rob, they had Steve Pete, Andrew Titley, Helen Mortimer, Kerry Basin, Ian Collins, probably more than that as well. Uh, and yes, they were sponsored by a beer company. And if you know anything about uh, British mountain bike history, and you know those names, you know that having all of those people in the same place with added beer is probably a bad idea. So let's take a look at this bike. It's crazy just comparing the two, old and new, just how kind of spindly and small the components look on this bike. It's ridiculous, except for the pedals, which are Odyssey triple trap flats, or bear traps as we call them. Those were pretty legendary pedals and very expensive back in the day. Let's take a look at the shock. It's actually, again, Marzocchi. It's got an inch of stroke, which translates to two and a half inches of travel at the rear. So back in the day, everything was measured in inches. Uh, up front, we've got a 1.75 inch of travel on the Marzocchi XC400 fork. 
In modern numbers, that equates to about 66 millimeters of rear travel, 44 up front. This is a TIG welded aluminium frame with a high pivot swing arm on there, although it doesn't have a, an idler wheel on there. So you'll see some of the disadvantages to that already. When I sit on it, I felt it pretty crazy. It's also recommended that you set this bike up with zero sag. So that feels pretty odd as well. And as soon as you touch that rear brake, it pretty much locks up that rear suspension. When you compare the bikes side by side, you can see some massive differences in geometry over the last 30 years. For example, let's take a look at the reach. That's 415 on the old bike versus 465 on the new. A stem of 130 mil, 45 mil on the new bike. Head angles, 71 and 63. Seat angles, 73 and 66. The old bars are 620 mil wide, whilst the new ones are 760. And the old bike is 14 and a half kilograms, whereas the new Daniel bike is only 16 and a half kilograms, but almost twice the size. Got some more retro names on the components. Some that are still around today, we've got Richie, Toyoga, Magura brakes and that sort of famous bright yellow. Hydraulic brakes up front, the cantilever hydraulics actually work quite well in the dry. It's had an upgrade to a disc brake on the rear, floating one made by a company called Saks which I don't think is still around in the bike world. I think they make sort of automotive clutches, things like that. But it's got that rear floating disc, but also uh, Saks uh, derailleur and kind of this internal two-speed hub, which I know nothing about it, to be honest, but quite interesting. It's got a single uh, chain up front and that two-speed rear hub. Interesting on the front brake, you've kind of got these braces, kind of a bit of bodge almost, that sit inside the crown because these are so powerful. If you pull them really hard, it would actually flex the bosses on the fork and on the, on the rear of the bike as well. So that stops that from happening. It's kind of make your brake work a little better. 26 inch wheels, of course. This is way before we started arguing about all that stuff. Radially laced on the front wheel. I don't know where that would be. It's not as strong as crossing the spokes. And, uh, Onza tires, 1.9. I can't remember what this uh, tread is called. Let me know in the comments down below. I'm sure someone will out there. I've dug through the archives and I found how Dave set up this bike for his 1992 World Champs. He has six 35 millimeter wide bars, a short 120 mil stem, because he likes being behind the bike. He had a triple chain ring and he had 42 PSI in the front tire, 44 in the rear which gives you an idea just how bad the tyres and the suspension were back in the early 90s. How do you even compare it to a modern bike? Look at the size of like the tyre compared to that one. Massive brakes, carbon fibre, 200 mil of really plush suspension, a triple clamp fork for extra stiffness, 200 mil of travel, direct mount stems, just crazy good how uh, a modern downhill bike is for riding downhill. It's really hard to compare these things, but anyway, I'm gonna leave my dream bike alone, just for now, and I'm gonna ride the old bike to actually see what it's like. Okay, this is a downhill bike, so I'm gonna do a downhill run on it, but uh, I've gotta get up to the top first. Um, I have been pushing a lot of it, but initial impressions, I am sort of surprised by uh, how good some things are. I'm shocked by how bad other things are. Geometry feels crazy. How do you race down on this? Like my, like it's more slammed at the front than it, my cross country bike. It's got tires that are about the same size as my gravel bike. So I'm, I'm scared. I'm feeling a bit apprehensive. And also the pedal kickback on this thing is insane. Look, look at my foot when the suspension goes in. When I stand up and crank this thing, it almost feels like you've got an oval chainring or something weird. It does this weird thing. I don't know how it's going to feel going down the hill. This Saks two-speed rear hub is crazy good. Why did we ever go to front max when this thing existed back in the 90s? It's actually really good. Um, that's about it so far. I'm kind of worried about riding this thing downhill. I'm, I'm kind of, I know these forks. I used to have a set a bit like this and those bolts broke if you over tighten them. So I've given this bike a very thorough check over. It's been really well looked after, I've got to say. Whoever this bike was is really good, but the, the fork is crazy hard. It's leaking oil. I don't have a disc brake, so it's not the end of the world, but it's not great. And it feels very kind of weak and spindly, this bike. So I'm going to go, go steady down the hill, but um, so far, you know, I'm not reassured with confidence riding this bike up the hill. 
Right, I'm doing one run and one run only because my nerves can't take any more. Dare I do any jumps on it? Well, Dave Cullinan did, so I probably should. Am I ready? Oh my gosh. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> I've got some issues with the shock already. And I'm not doing any jumps. Fair play to Dave Cullinan. Uh, doesn't sound so good. Kind of metal on metal. There's a lot of oil down here. Where's that oil coming from? It says 200 PSI on the side of it. Does that mean maximum? I feel like I'm 150. These old seals can't be trusted. God, f***ing Alma. I don't know what is the worst. Like there's the metal on metal clunking, which I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's the fork. There's a lot of oil appearing to that. It's, it's not feeling good, I've got to say. Also the fact that I'm, I'm running the flat pedals and I don't know what the suspension is doing. So trying to pedal over the bumps, like I'm scared my feet are just gonna fly off. I'm trying to avoid the bumps. It's horrible. I don't know what is the least sort of bad thing. I guess the brakes. The brakes do kind of work, but everything else. It's a no from me, dog. Nick, I think I've had enough, dude. Are there any like blue or even green down old tracks we can get to the cafe? Maybe I'll push. <laughs> I survived just about, and the bike mostly did. There's a lot of oil coming out of the fork. Um, I was a bit worried, as you might have guessed. It actually felt better there, like kind of where I've got way more grip hard pack. It felt all right, I could get weight onto the front wheel easy in those turns with that stem. It felt okay, but it was nothing like Mammoth Mountain and all those old Norba races. Um, on the technical stuff, this thing, just the geometry is crazy. I don't know how they ever did it. And like, you look at what you can do on a modern downhill bike, even free ride and that sort of stuff. It's crazy how far we've come in 30 plus years, but there you go, that's mountain biking. It's hard to know actually what to point to when you're comparing the new bikes to old ones. You know, what is it? It's kind of just a bit of everything. The geometry is so much better. The components are way more capable there. Everything's bigger and actually stronger and better, but for hardly any weight penalty, it's all over the old bike. So let me know if you like the nostalgia and the retro bikes and if you were racing downhill in the 90s. Get involved in the comments down below.